So what are some affordable housing options? How can we increase our affordable housing stock? And how can we build a community where everyone has a home? There are two presentations this evening, starting with representatives from BC Housing and Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. Dana Locke is the Director of Regional Development for BC Housing. Dana has worked with BC Housing for more than 25 years and has an extensive experience working with nonprofit societies, local communities, health authorities, and municipal governments to deliver affordable housing. She has worked in numerous communities around the province. Presenting with her is Karen Ungerson, Corporate Representative for the Affordable Housing Center of CMHC. As a marketing professional with Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, Karen has worked in the BC housing industry for 25 years, promoting the federal government's role in housing to a wide range of corporate clients. Her current focus is building partnerships with municipal governments, the nonprofit sector, and private industry to develop affordable housing opportunities across BC. Karen's previous public relations roles include working with the provincial government and with BC TV during Expo 86. Her experience in corporate communications is complemented by a journalism degree from Concordia University in Montreal and professional training and a professional background in training, project, and diversity management. So Dana and Karen. much to the uh, Comox Valley Housing Task Force for putting on this event. Um, I'm going to take approximately 20 minutes of your time. Hopefully, I have been known to speak for about three and a half hours without breathing. It is a life skill. I'm raising four teenagers at the moment, only two of whom I actually like, and they're not even mine. So um, I guess what I'm saying is Dana and, uh, and her colleague are going to uh, be sort of the timekeepers, and we'll keep this going fairly quickly. We will move right along fairly fast if I can find the clicker. So what we're going to cover off today actually, we're going to talk specifically to um, a wee bit of background on Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. As you may or may not know, we are a federal crown corporation. We've been in place since the mid 40s and really our role is one of ensuring that Canadians have access to safe, sound, quality, affordable housing from coast to coast to coast. We'll speak specifically to our affordable housing centre, um, that is the, or the uh, particular department that I work for, and then I think many of you may be interested in knowing what sort of dollars the federal government can bring to the table as it relates to the creation of affordable housing specifically in your community. And finally, I think one of the things we wanted to share today was very definitely drilling down to some of the best practices or the made in BC housing solution models that have been successful in other pockets of the province. So the um, Affordable Housing Centre was actually originally established in 1991. It had some long convoluted name. It actually sounded like a Russian hockey team. Um, but uh, it was initially put in place to help nonprofit organizations develop affordable housing that would not actually require long-term federal subsidies. In the mid-2000s, 2007 specifically, we were rebranded a wee bit, and we're now called the uh, Affordable Housing Centre. And really what we are are a group of corporate representatives um, spanning the entire country that are responsible for working with the various housing proponents to help you create affordable housing. And actually, since the inception of the organization, uh, the Affordable Housing Centre, the CP, sorry, CCPPH, um, basically, we have delivered over 62,000 units of affordable housing that have not required ongoing federal subsidy. Um, I think probably many of you are already very familiar with the housing continuum. The area that we're going to actually look at is that dead center area where you see affordable rental housing and affordable home ownership to the right of social housing. Um, affordable housing is not social housing, and I'm always interested, I've been here for pretty much the entire day, and I'm always interested to sort of hear about the continued or the um, sometimes um, uh, issues related to NIMBYism, because affordable housing is housing that is available for every single one of us who may not be in a position to seek rental or home ownership in the marketplace. And it's not social housing, it does not have that ongoing uh, subsidy typically. 
One of the things that we like to do is to get out into the various communities because we have been recognizing, certainly in the last five years that I've been with this particular department, that um, municipalities, private developers, the nonprofit service organization, and housing providers, and faith-based groups, you are all starting to talk. And really, as we go through today's presentation, you're going to learn that partnerships are really the be-all and the end-all of being in a position to create affordable housing. But a lot of these groups do not have the level of expertise that may be required or the access to potential funding to actually create affordable housing. And really that is one of the reasons that we come into play. We do, as I mentioned earlier, have a team of experts. Um, I don't really need to go through this, but one of our roles is to help you navigate through the financial, operational, and social challenges um, that are involved in creating housing. Normally when we come up into, a, um, into a, a municipality, what really people are interested in is understanding a wee bit more about what sort of funding might be available from the federal government. And I'm not talking to the funding that we already have in place to support the ongoing operation of social housing or to support our First Nations communities or to work closely with um, the province as it relates to our investment in affordable housing. I am talking about the grassroots dollars that are available and that can get into your hands as a community, a municipality, a nonprofit, a, a faith group, a service club, so that you are able to make a difference and to start building a concept. So first thing we are going to look at is um, specifically our seed funding grant. This is a $10,000 grant that is available for a group that is wanting to um, actually work past the creation of a concept. So you have a group of like-minded um, people in your community, could be already a society, it might be a municipality, and what you're really wanting to do is to work through the early stages of creating, a, uh, of creating housing. So we have a $10,000 grant that is available to you. Should those funds exhaust, and more than likely they will, there is a second level of our seed funding that may be available to you. If we see that your project has the legs to, to run, basically, we can also offer up an additional $10,000 in no interest loan to help you move through the early development, the concept work of your particular project. And some of the things that we normally would see that $10,000 grant money plus the potential addition of the $10,000 no interest loan would be to do a need and demand study, to build your business plan, to look at some early number crunching, that is your preliminary financial viability, possibly to do some preliminary design to incorporate if you're not an incorporated organization already. And these, in part, are going to be some of the same documents that BC Housing will be looking for as you continue the potential conversation with them. And I'll let Dana share more about that. Um, once uh, a group works through the early money, so the seed funding grant, the seed funding loan, the next component that may be available to a housing proponent would be an interest-free loan of up to $100,000. Now, uh, normally that $100,000 is only provided in an instance where you are cr creating significant units in your community, so for you to be able to access potentially the $100,000, we would normally look for you to be creating about 50 or 60 units. We do projects all the time where, you are, where, where housing proponents are creating less than 10 units, and if that's the case, it could be that we initially offer you around $25,000. Um, the dollars, again, are an interest-free loan, um, and it's pretty much they're there to support the activities during the early stages of development. So really your soft cost prior to the point where you would be eligible to arrange construction financing. The good news here is that if you do in fact create affordable housing, falling and fitting within CMHC's affordability criteria that is on our website and updated twice a year, it could be that you may be eligible for a forgiveness portion. Up to 35% of that loan amount can potentially be forgiven for a rental project that meets our, um, our affordability criteria at level one, level two, and level three. 
I should also let you know, however, that our proposal development funding dollars are not available for projects that are going to receive uh, federal government subsidies. And that is a conversation that you will have with us. It's a conversation you'll potentially have with BC Housing because um, the dollars cannot come in sort of like a double dip scenario. And uh, we do have to, uh, to work through, through those particular scenarios. Uh, typically, we would see for proposal development funding, your eligible activities could run anything from your ESA to your management plan, uh, development permits. I don't really need to go through the entire list, and I should let you know all of this information is available on our website at www.cmhc.ca. Now, um, if you are interested or if you are working with an organization or you are a municipal uh, representative here tonight, um, I should let you know that yes, of course, there are eligibility criteria to access these dollars. Um, if you are contemplating creating an affordable home ownership project, the sale price for those units must be lower than the average market price for similar units in the same market territory. If you are creating rental accommodation, affordable rental, then we would like to see a minimum of 50%, or truly it's 51% of the units must meet our affordability criteria. We are seeing more and more instances where developers um, and municipalities are working in partnership with, uh, with other housing proponents, where they are creating a mixed project that does have market units to help support the affordable units that are included in that particular project. Uh, virtually any form of, um, of housing is, uh, is, is, is available, or rather our RC funding is available and our PDF funding is available for virtually all forms of housing. I'm thinking specifically of new construction. We have done properties that have seen um, conversion, so going from a non-residential to a residential component, and I'm going to share a best practice project with you in a moment on that. And we have also um, got the ability to fund projects that, in fact, are simply renovating to prevent future demolition. So at the end of the day, what we are looking for is for you to ideally create a minimum of five units. Those units must be modest in size and design. And um, the other part of it, of course, is that there is, in fact, a demonstrated need in your particular community for the kind of housing that you're putting up. And I think that's fairly straightforward. And I think in most of British Columbia, it's very easy to identify need uh, in any given community. Some of the other things that we bring to the table are specifically our information tools and resources. Remember I said we are experts in our field. I like to kind of take a step back from that because as part of the work that we do, we are experts within the parameters of what CMHC can deliver on the seed and on the proposal development funding. Typically what groups do is they are using our seed funding dollars to actually hire a housing development consultant who can help you work through the labyrinth that it takes to uh, actually create housing in your community. And certainly BC, are you doing good plugs for BC Housing? And certainly BC Housing has an absolutely amazing um, housing development team who are really able to do that extra level of hand-helding once you're in dialogue with them about a project that they are uh, clearly in position to, uh, to work with you on. Um, other than that, we welcome you to come to our website. We have a wealth of affordable housing strategies and case studies. We host on a monthly basis an interactive web forum, so distance learning opportunity for you to connect with um, different uh, experts from across the country, look at best practices from other um, pockets of, uh, of Canada. We send out on a monthly basis an affordable housing e-newsletter if you're interested in signing up for that. And I think really one of the best um, combination of documents that we provide is something called the Housing Development Checklist and Fact Sheets that will work you through specifically um, uh, ideas around gaining community acceptance, building your business plan, identifying need and demand, um, creating your partners. Uh, all of those are available online on our website. For the developers in the room, we have a project viability assessment tool. And then finally, I know this got a little blurry at the bottom, uh, we also have affordable housing project profiles and success stories. And the reason I bring that up is we have over 300 
existing project profiles, but you can go online and pull up the specific, um, yeah, not municipality, the specific province you want to explore further, look at whether or not you're interested in seniors housing, family housing, are you looking for rental or home ownership, and this way we can really impart to you some of the best practices that other groups have done successfully. So what I thought I would do now is really take you through about five different um, project profiles, not at huge length, I'm, I'm sorry, it looks like the, uh, the presentation's got a little skewed, it's not my eyes and it's not your eyes. Um, this first model is a project that we did in 2010 in Abbotsford. It is an 11 um, unit affordable housing or 11 uh, unit uh, home ownership project in the city of Abbotsford, the very interesting part of this particular project was that as part of the um, home ownership uh, uh, um, unit, uh, the owners actually had the opportunity to also finish out a basement suite that they could actually use for um, additional income for the purposes of qualifying for that mortgage. Um, and what it really did is it not only provided 11 units of home ownership for moderate, low to moderate income families, it also allowed for an additional 10 units because the 11th um, homeowner didn't uh, decide to finish out their basement suite for, um, low, for low income seniors and persons with disability. Um, it was a true partnership. This was a project where the developer definitely stepped up to the uh, playing field and worked very, very closely with the city of Abbotsford. So the city of Abbotsford actually had a parcel of land. It was surplus land. They sold it at a 20 at 20 percent rather of its assessed value. They did in fact have to rezone to allow for those secondary suites, and there were some parking variances that came into play as well as reduced setbacks. One of the things, however, that they did because they wanted to ensure that these units would be available in perpetuity, would be affordable rather in perpetuity, is they did put in place a restrictive covenant. And uh, so all future sales of that, that particular townhouse development will be sold at 20% below market value. CMHC uh, came to the table with our proposal development funding. We also at the time had something called our RAP uh, secondary suite assistance. I, um, unfortunately, I, I, cannot, uh, I, I have to tell you that that pro program is no longer uh, in place. Um, but where it really got interesting was the developer, the Van Meren Group of Companies, was or is a benevolent developer. And he was building at a time where he recognized he was not going to be keeping his guys busy. I think this project started in about 2008, I think middle of the year uh, uh, roughly. And so he wanted to keep his guys working. So he actually did build at a reduced cost. His development costs were significantly reduced. Um, he also assumed the construction and the marketing risk. Now moving forward um, for this project, the qualifying borrowers are set at an income level below $60,000 per year. The other criteria is they had to either live or work in the Abbotsford area. And as you'll note below, the sale price of those particular units ran from about 216,000 to roughly 251,000, which at the time was just about 26 below market. Uh, CMHC also came to the table with some other mortgage loan insurance flexibilities. Um, and uh, it was a project that actually did see, um, it won a, a 2010 housing awards. Uh, and I think it also came in at about $220,000 uh, under budget. Those dollars were in fact returned to the Abbotsford um, Housing Trust Fund. So they were dollars that again could be used in perpetuity. So let's take another look at a project closer to home for you guys, at least we're on the island. Um, this is already in place, some of you may have heard of it already, but it's um, a project that, um, I guess, when did it complete? Probably about a year and a half ago, give or take, yeah. Um, so two local societies took on a shared vision of creating affordable housing on the site of what was once a former motel, and they specifically were focused on low-income families in Victoria. It is a 52-unit project. Um, it's owned by the Greater Victoria Housing Society, as well as the Greater Victoria uh, Rental Development Society. And it's a mix of market and below market two-bedroom units targeted to small families with incomes under 65,000. Uh, again, another be uh, benevolent um, 
uh, developer, I guess. Um, the developer uh, donated the development consultant fees, as well as created uh, the, something called the Great, a nonprofit organization called the Greater Victoria Rental Development Society. And that society is truly mandated to provide affordable rental accommodation for low to middle income families. The project is jointly owned 50 50. Um, I believe that the uh, Real Homes, or rather the Greater Victoria Rental Development Society, is also making available, as required, a $20,000 annual grant to ensure that the project is viable in the early years. And then um, other, um, other uh, partners in this project were, of course, BC Housing, under their Community Partnership Initiative, which you'll learn more of in a moment. We came to the table with seed and PDF funding, and then there were also equity contributions from the Capital Regional District, their ha Housing Trust Fund, the City of Bank, uh, Victoria, rather, their Housing Trust Fund. So there are two projects that I thought would be interesting. One was home ownership, one was rental, both were targeted to families. Next up is a project that actually one of the gentlemen on one of the panels this, uh, this afternoon actually spoke to, um, and that is the Murakami Gardens. It's a project on Salt Spring Island that was targeted to families and singles who are either homeless or at risk of homelessness. Uh, you'll note here that there are a fairly significant uh, level of partnership contributions, and I'm not going to go through um, all of the numbers. I think what's really interesting here is, in this case, the reason this project got, got off the ground was specifically a benevolent landowner. Um, this was a landowner, uh, the Murakami family, a Japanese-Canadian family that had been interned during the Second World War, had in fact lost all of their assets, and when they were able to come back to the island and reestablish on the island, they recognized that within their community there were real challenges related to low-income families and, uh, and singles. So they stepped up to the tune of about almost $500,000 worth of land value, as well as additional excuse me, additional equity injection or forgivable loan of just about $200,000. The Salt Spring Island Community Services Society was involved by way of funding. They are still involved to this day because they operate that particular project, um, as well as provide the support services that are required for the residents of that project. And uh, the Real Estate Foundation, the Capital Regional Housing Trust Fund were also involved. So I'm really wanting to give you a cross-section of what is possible when people come together to try and create something that is specific to the needs of a community. My next project, and I noted at the back, we do have, uh, well, Tom is here somewhere, we have representation from Habitat for Humanity. I'm sure many of you are very familiar with the work of Habitat for Humanity. This particular project um, is one that actually came about based on a group of parents who were looking to create housing for their adult or young adult children um, so that they would have safe, secure housing in perpetuity, even more so important in a time where perhaps the parents were no longer uh, able to support their children. So this is a seven stratified one and two bedroom unit project that was developed in, um, in Grand Forks. It was designed and built to uh, green gold standards and um, I think when Habitat first took on this project, they were, I think, probably panicked at the attempt to do that, but they were successful. Um, it is, it's targeted clients, of course, as I mentioned, were high-functioning adults, single men in this case, with disabilities. Uh, Habitat provided more than half a million dollars in donated equity, goods, and labor. CMHC was involved from the perspective of providing RC funding grant and loan dollars. BC Housing made a, I guess it was a, a lump sum um, uh, injection uh, through the sale of another property that um, had been owned by the province and the Ministry of Social Development was actually involved from the perspective of a job creation program. Um, other funding partners included certainly the city of Grand Forks. They waived, they provided the land, they waived the development and servicing fees. There was a real estate foundation, RBC TD came in with an equity injection. And I think what was really key here is others stepped up. Um, there was lumber provided by industry, there was work provided by plumbers, by electricians, all that were donated to this particular project. Yep. Um, you know what, I don't have that off the top of my head. I, I, I do have it in my notes. 
Um, so maybe I'll step aside with you later and we can, I can go through that with you. I can't read my notes because I don't have my glasses on. <laughs> okay, this whole middle age thing is not good. Um, okay, moving forward, um, the last project that I wanted to talk about, um, we've already hit Abbotsford, but we're going back out to Abbotsford again, really just to give you a sense of other possibilities. Um, this is a microsuite project, and again, it's a partnership between a developer and an existing nonprofit society. This nonprofit society has been operating um, for more than 50 years, and it had, I believe it was managing about 40 units of housing for um, single <coughs> adults. Uh, they recognize that their housing stock, and I saw it, uh, was getting extremely dilapidated and no longer served the best interest of the client group that they were hoping to serve. So they, in effect, sold that land to a private developer, used the dollars that they were able to get from the sale of that land um, to purchase another piece of land, which the private developer, in this case was Alper Brothers, actually went ahead and created or developed something called the micro suite housing concept. So these are units that are less than 300 uh, square feet. They come completely furnished with built-in furniture, think IKEA on, uh, on steroids. Um, and it really did give the residents, uh, the, the, will give the residents the opportunity to move directly from the homes they may have lived in for 20, 30, or 40 years in some cases, directly into a clean new environment that better suits their needs located close to amenities on public transit and uh, much healthier from the perspective of, of overall risk. Um, what else can I tell you about that project? Oh, the city of Abbotsford. Uh, came to the table with rezoning and, uh, and their development permit. They didn't charge DCCs for the, well, they don't charge DCCs for units under 300 square feet. CMHC had our money in, and I believe BC Housing was also involved under the CPI program. I think so. So that's really the five projects that I wanted to talk about. Um, if you are interested in learning a wee bit more about CMHC and what we can do for you uh, within your community to help you create uh, affordable housing, I encourage you to visit our website. I will make sure that I leave a stack of cards at the door on my way out, as, as well as some collateral. And um, if you want to take a look firsthand at the impact of, uh, of the work that we do, um, you can actually access a number of our videos on uh, YouTube, of all things. So um, on that note, I think I'll turn things over to Dana. Are we, are we taking questions or we're holding? It's up to you. It's up to us, I think. We don't, why don't we wait till the end because I think what will happen is some of what Dana will share to help put the pieces together. Can I ask one because I actually have to leave? Sure. Go ahead. Um, the, uh, the common wisdom is that the federal government was built out of funding uh, housing in the, uh, um, in the 90s. And uh, so I would guess that most people aren't even aware of the extent to which um, these programs still exist, but right. how much money is going into this uh, uh, compared to what it used to be? In debt? Well, I can't speak to what it used to be. What I can share with you is an annual basis, um, the federal government still injects $2 billion um, per year into um, affordable or into housing in Canada. Uh, $1.7 billion of that supports the roughly just about 595,000 Canadian households who are in need. And um, through uh, the investment in affordable housing, so the, the, um, the partnership arrangement that we have with the provincial governments, and this is the case actually in many pockets of the country, um, the investment in affordable housing in, um, for the years, I think 2011 through 2013, it was a shared, uh, a, a, a shared contribution of 1.4 billion. We have just announced um, the uh, extension of the investment in affordable housing, which will now take us through to 20, 
uh, sorry, 2019, and I believe an additional 1.25 billion is being invested. I have fact sheets with me, so you can actually drill down and see exactly where the dollars are going, um, but we didn't want to get too hung up because I think what we wanted to share today, I think the real message is the federal government is still hugely involved in housing. We simply have a different distribution model of how the dollars get out to British Columbia and other provinces across the country. How do I do? Good. And we'll walk away. Hi, everyone. I'm Dana. Um, thank you for having me here. I just wanted to introduce Donna Money, my co worker who came with us today. Donna's doing a, a few projects up in this region. This is kind of her area. Um, um, so if you have any housing questions after we leave today, feel free to call me or you can give Donna a call as well. Yay. So just a quick, a quick overview of BC Housing. We've been around since 1967. Uh, we're here to develop, manage, and operate affordable housing. So we um, manage over 7,000 units of affordable housing directly that we own uh, around the province. We uh, subsidize nonprofit housing and we, oh, and we also develop and work with nonprofits to develop housing. We're also a National Housing Act insured lender, which is, um, not necessarily something that's across uh, in other provinces that's available. So this is a real benefit that we can offer to um, to nonprofits, and uh, we also have the HPL, the Homeowner Protection Office, it has become part of BC Housing. They still have their own branding. So part of our mandate is also improve the quality of residential construction and protect the consumers, just on rentals and on home ownership. So. BC Housing has strategic priorities that we work to every year. We have six right now, we're actually changing to four. Um, I won't go into the details, but really, we're looking at supporting the nonprofit sector. I want to just go to that one. And the one, respond to critical housing gaps. Those are two that we're really looking at um, in this slide, so I'm sort of addressing those ones. The partnership model, I think Karen spoke about partnerships. You'll hear me say partnerships, partnerships, partnerships. They are so critical in the creation of housing in your community. What we have here is just a sort of a little bit of a matrix of community-based housing delivery, that foundation, that's where it starts. It is in your community, it is what your community needs and how it happens. Feeding into that are the partners that you bring in. And this is just, there's lots, health authorities, provincial government, federal governments, local government, the nonprofit sector, the reason that they're there in red is because they typically are the ongoing, the, the Kevin Albert from McCullough earlier stated 35 years. Sometimes they're signing 60 year land leases, they're into this for 60 years or more. And then you'll have societies, Karen mentioned Lindhaven, 50 years redeveloped, they're in for another 50. That'd be 100 years by the time that building's, that site's redone. So this is a long term investment. And others, financial institutions, your local developers, uh, you know, there's a lot of support and leadership, maybe not cash, but uh, um, expertise at the table that can be offered to you. Community champions, you can't get away from that person that supports you, that community that supports the project you're gonna, you're gonna do. And even your, your local bands and local governments, uh, band governments that are also part of your communities. So BC, BC Housing's role is we're a role of stewardish, stewardship, I can't say the word, and accountability. So what we're here for is, we're one of the partners, we see ourselves as a partner in the, in the delivery of projects in your community. We can provide advice, we sometimes, when we get funding programs, we'll have the delivery of those funding programs. Um, Karen talked about pro, uh, project development uh, funding. The seed funding from CMHC kind of is the start and you get the business case. If you come to us and your project's gonna move forward, we would actually also do project development funding that helps you take the project to construction start, and out from there. We have more financing, both interim uh, construction financing, but we also offer takeout financing with full CMHC mortgage insurance for very good uh, fees. Um, we have projects that we, we can offer support services so, uh, when we have, and that's a really deep funded program. So we're in the process of finishing up, uh, building a bunch of those projects as well. And then the other item that we have that actually helps residents of your community access housing is we have a housing registry or a wait list. And what this is for is residents in your community can go onto the housing registry, find all the affordable housing and that's in your community, or maybe they're looking down the valley, or maybe even they're looking to relocate 
they need to move where their daughter is because they need assistance. This housing registry allows them to select the buildings or opportunities and nonprofit society projects that they would like to put an application in for. They put one application in, they're considered for all those locations. One of the comments about this is, this is a requirement of all housing projects um, since for the last eight or so years. Previous or older projects, they're not required to sign up for this, but they're welcome to. So you should still look around for your housing. One of the things we have found, especially with supporting housing or even um, other housings, and we talked about this earlier, you should be able to drive by an affordable housing project and not know it's there. So when you go to apply for affordable housing, how do you know where you should apply if there's no listing? So this is meant to be an ease of, so a senior needs to relocate, they can go on, they can find that, hey, there's five seniors housing projects in the Comox Valley, three of them are really locationally best for me, and I get a register here, and when one of those projects has a unit come up, their name would be one that would appear for them to be considered for the unit. The society still selects who they house. So I just like to put that out there, because I don't think, that, there's a lot of projects that aren't on this list, and I think it's a real, benefit to residents who are looking for affordable housing. So housing provider responsibilities. If you're gonna be a housing provider, what is it that you're committing to? It's a long-term relationship, we have said this. So again, on your board, a strong board, but a plan, um, I think it's important to have a plan to roll your board to in, encourage new members to come over on five-year periods or rollovers. We have a lot of societies been around for 30 years. The board hasn't changed in 30 years. Society is very tired, they're 85. And you know what? It's time for them to go away and, and for other members of the community to come in. So I do encourage that. The need and demand, the feasibility of what do you need? What is this target populations? What do you need in your community? Karen talked about that. We have templates on our website. I encourage you to go to, to understand who is the priority uh, residents in your community. And you might have three. There might be three that have really good needs, and it might be the second one that has a funding program come up. Are you ready in your community to get that funding program? Still gonna go for number one, still gonna go for number three, but are you nimble enough to be available to grab the one that's available? So you lead the development, they contract the construction, all the contracts are in their name, they sign loans, long-term loans, 35 years, they're responsible for ongoing property management, support services, tenant relations. Uh, they need to know RTA rules. Um, they have access, the housing providers have access to service providers. Maybe they don't specifically offer services, but how do they partner in their communities so that they know what services are available and can bring those services to their residents or refer their residents out. Um, so it's again, not duplicating or tripling up services in the community. And they are the face in the community. That nonprofit society is the one that is at the town hall, is the, the agency that the community trusts to deliver and operate that housing. And that, I think, is a critical thing. They're not going to trust the province to deliver it. They're not going to trust the municipality to deliver it. They're going to trust that local community nonprofit. They are the ones that are engaging. So going to our community partnership initiatives, Karen referred to it. Um, we have sort of two options. We have a funded supply program and we have community partnerships initiative, which is really a financing opportunity. So right now our latest funding supply program is in progress. We're just finishing up building um, those units. Uh, the um, John Horn that was here today, he was attending a groundbreaking for one of the uh, supported housing projects in Nevada <laughs> before we had it up. We still have another one to build there. Um, just an example of pro projects. So there's still more units coming on stream that are supported in communities, but those are allocated. We're preparing for new programs. Cross our fingers. Um, the monies that Karen talked about have to be matched provincially. Uh, we've matched them for the last three years. This is the last fiscal years. And the next fiscal years we're hoping, cross our fingers, that we'll have the provincial matching monies for those federal dollars. We don't match it, we don't get the federal dollars. Um, and then we have our community partnership initiative. And this is low cost financing. This is on our website. You can apply at any time. It's a rolling call. You don't have to wait for anything. You can come to us, talk to us, and make application and, and uh, under this program at any time. This is just an example on our website. I encourage you to go there. Um, it's uh, new was, uh, housing opportunities, current supply programs, community partnership initiatives, and then some of the um, Lending criteria guide, need demand templates, cost target frameworks. There's some tools in that that you can you can go to on the website to help you out. 
Some of the highlights of CPA, what does it offer you? This is not a program that's going to give you a shelter or transitional supported housing. That needs more funding. This is one that's going to help you with that affordable uh, rental and affordable potentially even home ownership if you want to go that way. So we provide construction finance that we can provide up to 100% financing. We charge whatever Treasury Board charges us at one and one sixteenth percent monthly. Um, we're about 1.3% right now. There's no loan insurance on the construction financing, and we only we charge a 1% loan fee. We can also provide takeout financing. What we do here is we have an agreement with CMAC, so we provide loan insurance. We tender all the loans at the same time. So if your project's a million dollars, you might be in a tender for $30 million of financing. All of the subsidy projects we have, every renewal gets tendered. So we, we put out $30 million in CMAC insured mortgages. We get the best rate there is. And you get, we'll give 35 year amortizations. Um, and we will do, uh, we, right now we're going for 10 year terms, which gives some security in the future. We also charge $75 a unit in mortgage loan insurance. And anyone else that's maybe done, and that's because of our agreement with CMHC, maximum $5,000 in loan insurance. If you were going to the private sector lenders, you'd be paying three, four, five percent of your budget for this loan insurance. <coughs> and this is, of course, all subject to being approved through uh, the financing model. And you're gonna run through a couple projects. I just wanted to stimulate some ideas here. We did a project in Vernon, new construction, Vernon Viridian it was called, the developer named it. The developer had a plan pre the downfall of 2008, and he was gonna build 12 townhouses, two, six, two rows of six in Vernon. And he had the plans done, and then it wasn't gonna market, he couldn't market it to sell it, so he thought, what will I do? Um, it, uh, again, a developer who wanted to do something in the community, so he started to approach nonprofits. Can I build this for you? Take a bit of a cut on my, you know, not looking to sell the units, but um, looking at the uh, opportunities here. So what he did is he had 12 two-bedroom units. The society he went to, one of the societies, was a society that um, uh, was responsible for people with developmental disabilities, and they did not need these two-bedroom units. The other thing about these two bedroom units, they were one bedroom upstairs, one bedroom downstairs. Not the best model for moms with young babes. So what did we need? So what he did is he reallocated the exact same square footage and created eight bachelor units, the bedroom and the bathroom downstairs became a small unit. Uh, the upstairs became a one bedroom unit and then he had uh, in eight of the townhouses that made 16 units. And then we did four two bedroom units. I bring this up as an example because when you're starting out, you're doing a first project in a community, and you say you want families and you need singles, and the, the small units could have been for students, the one bedrooms could be, they were walk up, so younger seniors, or again, just women living, you know, second stage housing for women from transition. This is a 20 unit project that had the opportunity to serve three, four, five potential client groups that fit. 15 years from now, maybe there's more housing in the community and families was needed, it's just one wall comes out and it becomes all two bedroom units again. So what can you do today, but what could, and it could possibly be in the future when you get those, that third project, the fourth project, the fifth project in your community. So just stimulating that. Cost-wise, this is the same square footage. There was no difference in this project for 12 two bedrooms to 20 units. What the society, um, or what we were able to do is, uh, this is just giving you an example of the difference between the budget to do 12 and the budget to do 20. There was more kitchens. We actually had to sprinkler it because when it's stacked townhouses, you, or stacked, you have to sprinkler it, but we felt that was a good investment um, for supply safety. The operating costs are a little bit higher uh, because you have more units, um, more maintenance, more fridges, more stoves. We actually, although it says thir three million, we came in at 2.8 at the end of the day. We were able to have, um, Vernon is a very supportive community. This is where we go to knowing if your local municipal government are supportive or not of affordable housing. Because we had a great relationship with Vernon, we actually started building this project before it was rezoned to 20 units. Our worst case scenario is we just had 12 units. So we did the 20 units, Vernon said, go ahead, you can, Start construction and rezone at the same time, we're good with it. The biggest issue here was the parking variances. Not a big site, not a lot more room for parking. 
Um, it was a debate, should they only let us 16 because not enough parking, and council's decision was we're not giving away units for cars, we're doing 20. And that was, even the staff actually made a different recommendation. So they gave us that, that, uh, that break on the, um, on the parking, they also gave us DCC rebates, etc. So what I did here is I gave you an understanding of, for the 12 units, it's about $1,273 a month per unit in costs. For the 20, it's 993. I'm not suggesting these are affordable rents. This is a budget with absolutely no equity except for the DCC rebate. The land was paid for, everything was paid for. You typically are going to have a project with partners and other funding. You're going to bring this capital budget down. You may have some equity on the operating side and you can bring these rents down. You can also do a mix, some close to market, some more affordable. This project um, with a target of some developmentally disabled some of the reds are at 375, so we had to do some switching and changing. And to, I'm going to be honest, we didn't do this as 100% finance, but I just wanted to show the numbers. There was some grant dollars in this that brought the cost down. And just an example of the picture, the front is just a typical two eight townhouses. The picture on the left, um, you see the sidewalk coming down, that's where the entrances into the studios are. And then the deck above is for the one bedroom unit, and they all have garages uh, for the cars. So the one bedroom units and the two bedroom units all have a garage and then there's some surface parking. Again, noting the client group we were looking at um, as well as the location is just a block off of transportation. That's why we got the parking variances. There's a tot lot here and we did do one wheelchair accessible unit um, which added just a little bit of square footage. Every unit has a washer, dryer, um, fridge stove. Another example I wanted to go through is an opportunity of, that we did up in Williams Lake where we bought a motel. Um, and it wasn't a motel that was currently being used for housing. I think three people lived in it. It was 33 units. And so we bought the motel and we converted it to housing. And we convert, it had many size units. It had very small units right up to larger studio units. It is an at-risk population um, that lives in this project. The capital budget, again, an assumption of no equity was $1.4 million, $43,000 a unit. Um, the operating costs work out, if this project had no equity, is $638 a unit a month, as a, just an estimate. Um, the society that operates it, we do actually give them support dollars to operate it, but you could maybe have resources coming in depending on uh, who your residents were. So this is just an example of Williams Lake we delivered 33 units for $43,000 a unit. It's not the only project we did in Williams Lake that year, but it is something. This society absolutely loves this project. It really assists a lot of the homeless at risk populations. Williams Lake had a lot of problems with people coming in to the community and you know, with drinking and stuff like that and having nowhere to, to go, nowhere to transition out of alcohol and drug rehab, no affordable opportunities. And this provided that for them, an opportunity to give people a place to stay in town when they were maybe transitioning out of those supports. So it wasn't maybe the supports were desperately right here, but a place they could live after they've gone through those, those specifics. Again, just wanted to stimulate some uh, opportunity of ideas here. Um, I think that Karen showed you the Maricami Gardens, but she didn't mention, I thought she mentioned. It was a renovation of an old fish plant. It wasn't built from new, So it was taking an old fish, um, fish plant. The family donated the building and the land and they converted it to housing. Again, that was available in that community, that opportunity. This Jubilee, the, the left hand side is the, the old picture. And on the right hand side, you can see in the back, it was the pool. We just punched holes in the concrete, fill it with dirt, community garden, we have a nice gazebo there now. Um, and the office, the interesting thing about a motel is, this came with the offices and living space for the uh, manager, which became the society has offices, so they have the opportunity, even though they might be not there to run supports, but someone's staff are on site. It also had a restaurant. Um, they haven't started, or they, they, start, they didn't do anything with it, but there's an opportunity that the restaurant, social enterprise, meal programs and stuff, again, small community, what are those opportunities? So just ideas that you might, you might think about. Again, the unit on the left is, I don't think this thing has been redecorated since the 60s. And then on the right, 
Um, this is the smallest unit in there. It's just a small unit, its own kitchen that came with me, put a fridge in it. Um, some of the other units on the other side were, were a lot bigger than this. So, my little quote of the day, development's complex. It's, it's unique to your community, it's unique to what you're going to do. So, there's a lot of work before the invitations for the ribbon cutting, and there's a lot of work after it, but it's a great thing to do. And it, it, I went to a groundbreaking last week. 25 years the community's been working on that housing. 10 years the nonprofit has owned the land. They have bake sale. They have sold hot dogs and garages. They have finally 28 units, 20 seniors, eight families. It took a long haul, they stuck with it. And they celebrated, they had a band, it was a great party. So um, there is an opportunity to do that and then they'll celebrate when it's built. I just wanted to touch on a couple other opportunities. We have a home adaptations for seniors and dependents. This is a, a grant program for people that need to do some renovations to create independence in their home, own home. This is, um, for accessibility, so again, seniors can stay in place or people with disabilities. This is available for private landlords if they are agree to charge affordable rents as well, if they're renting affordable rents. So this is something, again, um, that if you know someone in your community, a good landlord that maybe has a few people that need some of these upgrades, there's an opportunity. I, I don't run this program, but just saying these, these opportunities are there. They do have to sign that it has to be affordable housing if you give them the grant. Two other rental assistance programs we have for the private market, I'm sure you guys heard about this, are shelter aid for elderly renters, um, for seniors 60 and over. And this is available in private rental units. The seniors apply to us for the subsidy. Their landlord may never know that they even get it. And a rental assistance program, this is for low-income working families that make less than $35,000 a year. And uh, again, in the private sector, we subsidize those residents directly. The reason I brought these up, when you're looking at CPL, where we just have provided financing, maybe a small grant, these programs are eligible. Residents in those housing projects can actually apply for this. So if you were doing a project and your numbers work out that you have to charge 600 bucks, but you know your seniors, maybe you're targeting, those seniors could actually apply for SAFER and be assisted in another way. So it's not a subsidy for the project. But it is, you know that if we charge $600, those seniors that really need help can actually have a place to go to get the help. So you don't have to try to drive your market, your prices, your rents down to 350 when you're doing it through a CPI. And the same with the rental assistance for their families. You might have some families that make more. Our CPI program, it's um, household income less than 65,000. So you can have some that maybe can afford close to market, but if some can't, they can have this, if they're working families, they have opportunities to apply for additional assistance even if you have a nonprofit has built the project. So I just like to bring that to people's attention. It's not a marketing strategy to only target these people, but that lends to maybe I have to charge $950 for a rent, but this resident only makes $20,000, they can apply for assistance to help them pay the $900. So BC Housing contacts myself, um, Roger Butcher, he was here earlier, he's our Director of Regional Development, our Director of Operations for, in the Victoria office, I'm in Burnaby. Uh, Donna's also in Burnaby, hers is 4192, I'm 4193. Donna's with an O, Dana's with an A, we're almost the same. So, <laughs> <laughs> that's it, so um, thanks very much, and I'll invite Karen up for uh, questions. We're actually um, a little bit over our time, so we're going to limit this to one one or two questions, if anyone has a question. I, I have a question. It's my understanding that in order to access the seed funding, whether a grant or a loan, you have to have a piece of property to start with. You have to typically have a piece of property or a um, potential for that land being transferred to you, so some form of a memorandum of understanding and or significant equity, and that's quite a valid question. Um, CMHC, we do want to, you know, because of limited budget dollars that are available, you know, for, uh, for any uh, program, uh, we want to be sure that we put our dollars behind those projects and have the best likelihood to succeed. And truthfully, without land available and or significant equity, it is very hard to get a project off the ground. Now, having said that, we do, um, sometimes there are flexibilities, um, depending on the particular association, depending on when you come to us in the funding cycle. We try to be flexible where we can, but we would always want to dialogue with you. 
um, in a scenario that you may not have land, but you have a plan to eventually acquire that land, we still want to hear from you. Yes. Um, I heard you mention a 35-year amortization on, on BC housing loans. So when we're doing our figures, can we incorporate in the figures a payback period of 35 years to you? Yes, and, and one qualifier there is if it's a renovation, it has, the amortization has to be five years less than the remaining life of the building. But for new construction, for sure, it's a 35-year amortization. And that applies to land acquisition costs as well? Your land can form part of your capital budget. Okay. One sure, more question. One final yeah. question on, on that uh, same point. Uh, does, do you have to go up to the 35-year? Can you do that in a... In a 20 year amortization? Yeah, you can do it less than your numbers work. We're yeah, happy to do well, that. I mean, it's we have to reach a certain debt, debt coverage ratio, yeah. which is it is right, it's very hard to do that, even if your land is free and you have equity. And we do for affordable housing, we do it at 1.1, so it's yeah. it's actually quite a low DCR as well. Yeah. But um, if you're able to say you have lots of equity, so you prefer the loan to be 20 years for sure, we can do that. The uh, mini complex that was uh, did in, done in uh, Abbotsford, was that a rental unit or was that a... Uh... Th those particular units are rental units, so managed by a non-profit society, the Lynn Haven Society. Having said that, I know the city of, Ab uh, not Abbotsford, the city of Surrey uh, has been working on a number of micro units um, that I believe may be home ownership. Um, and we've certainly seen some of those in Vancouver yeah. as well. Yeah. Surrey's definitely done the home ownership, but not with any funding. No, yeah, us. and we weren't they, involved in that either. They've allowed it. And a, a combination uh, uh, complex would, would fit the criteria as well? Some owned, some rented? We, we would certainly be able to have that dialogue. Yeah. Um, it's not always a model that's easy yeah, to... It's sometimes hard to market, but yeah. it is something we would, we would look at. <coughs> Yeah. So one quick question. Does it have to be a nonprofit? Could it be a joint venture with uh, with uh, just folks in the community? Housing, yeah, we're, we it does not have to be a nonprofit. I mean, we work with private developers. We work with service clubs, municipalities, uh, faith groups, and other great land source. Um, you know, uh, look, yeah. looking out to your uh, to you know to your faith community. Are there um, you know churches with um, changing? Um, what's the word? Parishes, parishes, yes, parishes yes. Of, you know, parishes that are shrinking. A lot of church, a lot of parking, and not enough people to fill it. Um, sometimes, that your uh, faith groups are, are want to come to the table, so it's not prescriptive. For us, the we can do construction financing for private. Yeah, we cannot do takeout. Our takeout has to be a nonprofit. So what we sometimes see is maybe a, a private, maybe a nonprofit doesn't want to take that risk. So a private developer goes in and we finance him to build it. Yeah. And then you'll flip it, and the nonprofit gets the takeout, but they don't take the risk on the bill. It's another way to work with the developers, or we put restrictions, and they get a if they're private, they'll get a loan from someone else. But we do restrict titles um, to make sure it's affordable. Okay. Okay. Hey, thanks. I want to thank these ladies for spending the time with us this evening to uh, impart a lot of very technical, but also very um, accessible the way you presented it. So thank you very much for coming tonight. And uh, I just will give them a hand. <laughs> we'll have you back, I'm sure. Um, we have one more pres presenter tonight, and <clears throat> it's uh, Sandra Hamilton. She's a BC partner for so social impact, a business consultant and marketing specialist who has spent much of her career working with Olympians as they transition into the business, into business from the world of sport. Through her work with high-profile Canadians, she was John Furlong's and Silken Longman's business manager. Ms. Hamilton has acquired a passion for social innovation and believes that business can be a powerful force for social good. Last year, Sandra was instrumental in creating Canada's first, very first MBA degree program in social enterprise leadership. She is the program adjunct at the Sandra Moen School of Business, where she's also pursuing her executive MBA in social enterprise leadership. Sandra's just back from the Social Enterprise World Forum, a global gathering of 1,200 delegates from over 30 countries, and we're happy to have her here to share some of the current thinking and ideas which could be applied here in the Valley. So, Sandra Hamilton.
I missed uh, a lot of the day. I was, I was working at, at home today. Um, has there been um, any conversation about social enterprise throughout the day? Not much, not predominantly for social enterprise, but it's been mentioned. So you've been very tactical on, um, on homeless strategies and, and building. Okay, all right. So we're going to finish um, on a slightly different note. I'm not going to speak specifically about homelessness. I'm going to talk about how do we use business to address social challenges. And I've spent 30 years in business. I've spent the last 20 helping Olympians transition into business. And what's wonderful about working with Olympic athletes is, number one, they're not money motivated. And number two, they're not afraid of big visions. So when you bring those two things together and you start talking to Olympic athletes, they go on to do some very interesting things after they're no longer Olympians. And what I have learned from working with them is it does take a very strong idea, a shared vision, and a lot of passion to actually move ideas forward. I have the privilege of speaking at biz to business groups, and there's very rarely nonprofit groups there. And then I come and speak to nonprofit groups who are doing incredibly good work, and business is not there. And we have to change that. We have to get everybody in the same room at the same time. Because what we've just heard from BC Housing and what we've just heard from CMHC is of the importance of partnerships. And we don't want to build something by hot dog sets. There's a limit to how many golf tournaments that we want to play. So, <laughs> I'm not yet, maybe there isn't for some of you, but for me there's a limit to how many golf tournaments I want to play. So, we've got a very strong model in business. What we need to do is this, with a little bit of change in uh, government regulations, I think we can create an environment where we can actually start to see more social impact from the businesses that we have. So I'm going to spend it's about 10 minutes that we'll work through some ideas and hopefully we'll leave um, inspired as to how the Comox Valley could in fact be a showcase for social innovation because I think we have the right ingredients and we're one of the few communities in the entire country that has all the right ingredients to actually do this. You probably will hope you want to find out what we have. So the Vancouver Olympics taught us a lot about social impact purchasing and community engagement. So one of the things I learned as I went through the process um, of bidding for the Olympic Games and then working with the Olympic Games was it really doesn't matter how much sense it makes in people's heads. It only matters how much sense it makes in their hearts. So try to make an argument that is rational and well thought out doesn't always get you where you want to go. You absolutely have to tell your stories from the heart and you have to connect with people on an emotional level. We are human beings and we're emotional beings. So the communication is really important. You need to be inspiring to get people to show up and to care. Are we in fact the only people in the valley that care about homelessness? I doubt it. Could we package it in another way? Can we package any of our social problems in a different way so that people who are looking for more meaning in their lives will come together? The beauty of social enterprise is it is a wonderful way of uniting unlikely partners and bringing people that you wouldn't ordinarily see in the same room into the same room. At the Olympic Games, the um, RFP contracts that went out asked for community benefit, and that was a really important part of um, engaging the downtown east side and to training women from the downtown east side to be florists who prepared the, the bouquets. There were many, many examples of how an RFP language can actually have an incredible social impact. And in my opinion, the fastest way to have a social impact is to start working on the language in our RFPs. Does everybody know what an RFP is? So a request for proposals, a, a business tendering process. So business is becoming a lot more social, and the social sector is becoming a lot more entrepreneurial. And so we should accept that that's happening and get everybody in the same room. This is what I think the continuum looks like. We started a 19th century charitable model donations to address things like homelessness and some of our biggest social challenges. We moved into government, a social service network, with some government contracts. 
Now we're moving into a social enterprise area, which is a business run by a non-profit. There's some debate on what exactly the exact definition, but I think that gives you the idea. Then we have socially responsible businesses are moving beyond corporate social responsibility to the far end of, of strictly for-profit businesses. That's the continuum. We can absolutely develop hybrid businesses in British Columbia that are, have a foot in each camp. You can make money whilst doing social good. So how do we advance the non-profit sector? We have a huge non-profit sector in, in Canada. This sector is really important to Canadians. 165,000 non-profit organizations, half of them are charities. They cannot all survive. It is incredibly difficult. Anyone who is on a board knows how hard it is now to raise a donated dollar. And many people do not want to be on a board that is constantly chasing a government agenda. They want to achieve their social impact. They don't want to be constantly chasing the dollars. So there are only three sources of income for a charity in Canada. It's either a donated dollar, it's a government grant or a, a, a government funded contract from a, found, a contract with a foundation, or it's earned revenue. Of those three, only earned revenue is scheduled to increase. The other two are becoming more and more difficult. Government tax dollars, we don't have to talk about that, and the pressure on a government tax dollar, and the donations are becoming more and more expensive to actually earn because it's an incredibly competitive field. But the beauty of earned revenue is that it is unrestricted dollar and you can go where you want to go for your own social impact. The non-profit sector, particularly the social services sector, don't throw anything at me, but they're really, really bad at marketing themselves. It is an incredibly diverse group of agencies working in a lot of turf protection and they absolutely need to come together and start working together more so that they can tell the story of the good that they actually do in this country. And currently one in 10 Canadians are working in the nonprofit sector. We don't have, a, that's not a voice that's seen in our mainstream media, it's not a voice that's seen across this country. 8% of GDP, that is what the nonprofit sector accounts for in this country. That's bigger than finance. It is a significant size and it needs, we need to get better at having a place at the table. If you look at the Comox Valley Economic Development Plan that was put together by Seabeds, and this is not a criticism of Seabeds, this could happen in absolutely any community in this country, there is not one social service agency named as a partner in developing anything in the economic plan. So that's a miss. How can we be planning our communities and the economic future of our communities without including social service agencies if, and, and, non, and the non-profit sector? If we count for 10% or more, I think, in the Commonwealth Valley, of our communities. So we have to stop doing that and start working together. The Vancouver 2010 Olympics taught us an awful lot about social impact purchasing, and that knowledge has now gone on to Glasgow and to the Pan Am Games in Toronto. I've just come back, as you heard, from the Social Enterprise World Forum, which happened to be in Calgary, first time it's been in Canada, goes on to South Korea next. The leaders in the community all had Scottish accents. The best ideas had thick Scottish accents. Luckily, I'm from Manchester, I could understand most of them. So, <laughs> Um, incredible knowledge and ideas that's coming out of Scotland right now. They are absolutely leading in this sector. The legislation, the first legislation that actually demands for the public sector to have social impact uh, policies and social impact purchasing policies has just come into effect in Scotland. So that's a kind of social innovation that I think we, we need to be seeing here to affect how we spend our tax dollars. If we are going to have less money in our social service sector, let's at least be using the tax dollars that are in the system and leveraging them as much as we possibly can. In 
Ontario. Ontario is, is leading in the local food movement. They're doing some amazing things around local food. And they have a hospital, Scarborough, which now has a demand for a certain percentage of local food to be, to be in their supply chain. This is the woman who created that, and she's just been hired by Ryerson University, and Ryerson is demanding 25% of all on-campus food is local. And local in that definition is Ontario plus 50K. So we're starting to see public sector procurement um, being impacting social. And I think it's important for the Valley that we bring that thinking here. We have two new hospitals that we're building. Imagine if the food distribution company that is supplying the hospitals was owned by charities. It doesn't have to be owned by for the private sector. There is nothing stopping charities from owning a business. We have something in British Columbia called the Community Contribution Company. And that is the first time in over 100 years in Canada that we've created a brand new way of incorporating a business. It's only in British Columbia. So that allows the public and private sectors to work very efficiently together. And I think when you are building two new hospitals in the middle of an agricultural community, it is our responsibility in this community to ask, could we in fact feed ourselves? We used to feed ourselves. We probably could again. From a marketer's point of view, from a business consultant's point of view, it is my belief that if we match the supply to the demand, we can absolutely do it at commercially viable prices. So that's something that when you go into the North Island Hospitals uh, project community meetings, ask, why aren't we feeding ourselves our own food? Why are we not growing our own food? Why couldn't the food distribution company be owned by our social service sector? so we don't have to do hot dog sales to pay for our infrastructure. It, it does happen already. We wouldn't be the first to do this. Bosch, which you may have heard of, <laughs> probably have a, a kitchen appliance from Bosch or have driven a car with a Bosch part. German engineering company, um, 350 subsidiaries worldwide, one of the biggest companies in the world, incredibly innovative company. It is owned by a charity. The Laurel Point Inn in Victoria is owned by a charity. So these models exist. There is nothing stopping and starting to do this here in the Valley. Atira in the downtown east side is an incredible story of how Janice Abbott, the executive director there, decided to set up a for-profit business. And she was taking it purely to make money to apply to her transition society. Now, 10 years later, 280 of her 320 employees are clients of the Transition Society who now have jobs as well as housing and they're running a profitable business. So that's the kind of model that I think that we need to be looking at in the Valley. Why the Comox Valley? Well, one really good reason is we happen to have Canada's very first Minister of Social Innovation. So Don McRae is the country's first Minister of, Ed, uh, Minister of Ed, uh, Social Innovation. And I would think that Don wants to do something socially innovative in his, in his own community. We are building these two new hospitals in the middle of an agricultural community. And those hospitals are major taxpayer funded economic engines. How can we best leverage them to fund our social programs? Island Health, that used to be called VHA, has a responsibility to contribute to the health of our communities. Their current social, their, no, not social, their current purchasing policy says buy the cheapest they can get hold on. That is no longer acceptable. We have to take the tax dollars that are coming into the system at the top. Nobody wants to pay more taxes. So we have to take the tax dollars as they come in and fully leverage them. Nobody's suggesting that we suddenly pay 30% more for our food. But what we are suggesting in social enterprise is we deliver on price, we deliver on quality, and we deliver on a social impact. We can do all of that 
if we can get the political buy-in and the cooperation of these non-profit health authorities to give us the information we need to get to the farmers so that we can actually make a profit. That same model can be applied to many, many different social enterprises. I'm just giving one example that I think changes the thinking, I hope opens the thinking a little bit to what else might be possible. There is a BC Partners for Social Impact website, there's 35 of us, and collectively we've been working to advise the government on policy that we need in British Columbia to try and improve how business can contribute to the social economy. I'm one, I'm the only one in the Comox Valley, there's a few in Victoria, but it's heavily downtown east side focused. So the social economy in BC involves the community contribution company. We now have Social Enterprise Day, and we're working on creating social impact bonds, bringing the Nova Scotia idea of a community investment bond to British Columbia, <coughs> and we're very hopeful that we will secure a social investment tax credit. So those are the next things that we are trying to bring to British Columbia. The UK definitely leads the sector on social enterprise globally. And in a recent survey, they identified government procurement policies as the most significant barrier to advancing social enterprise. If we can take their learning and advance it, and we do have the minister here, so if we can do something really spectacularly interesting in his riding, I think we will get the political support and we can align it with our hospitals. We should be able to move social impact purchasing to impact how we look after each other. So we need to work together, and I believe our two new hospitals present quite an unprecedented opportunity to deliver a social impact while improving the economic health of the entire community. I hope that gave you something to think about at the end of the day. Thanks. Um, any questions? Um, I'm quite interested in, in what you're talking about, but I was surprised that you didn't mention the word cooperative once at all, not at all. And to me, that is the model that fits, it's compatible, it's not entirely about that, but it is an ownership model. It's private enterprise where the owners have decided to distribute the benefits a little differently and decided that part of what they're doing is to create businesses that will serve themselves in one way or another. And I, I feel it's a very powerful model and one that we don't use frequently enough and one that if you look at examples, not just successes here in Canada or back in England or wherever, but the entire modern system, the economy of northern Spain, which is based on the cooperative model through every single service and makes government almost completely unnecessary. I'm just surprised that you didn't, didn't mention. mention it at all. Is that because... It's 15 word? minutes I was given. Uh, <laughs> that word in sure. co-op. I'm a huge, huge fan of co-ops. They have a place. They're not, it's not always the right tool, but it is a very important tool. And on Friday, I presented a, a much longer presentation to a Coastal Community Credit Union, um, credit unions obviously being co-ops, on the very basis that they are well-placed to be the bridge that we need to bring together the private and the non-profit under a, what would be a cooperative model and to really lead this going forward. So I'm a huge fan of co-ops and I'm very familiar with Italy and Spain and a lot of the models that they've done there. Um, the Italians are fabulous at uh, flouting convention and, and laws. And, and culturally, what we found when we looked at Italy is they look at government rules and they go, hmm, hmm, how can I do something with that? And how can I get around that? And let's look at creative ways to get around that. Uh, unfortunately, I think in Canada we say, hmm, that's the rule and we're, we're sort of immovable. We don't look for ways around it. And, and the Italians, I think we can learn an awful lot from how they actually manage to, um, to get around the rules, including just unbundling a lot of large contracts. And the Italians know when, what triggers a trade barrier and when, when they're gonna hit problems. 
So they just unbundle them and just make them lots of small contracts instead of putting them out there as big. And we're not asking enough questions here. We're not demanding enough. And I think in the Comox Valley, as we get an increasing amount of baby boomers who are coming here and becoming more socially active and more environmentally active, I'm hoping that we get more vocal questions because that's what we need to, to impact change. I find myself in a very interesting situation where I'm both a business owner and working on the board of a nonprofit mm -hmm. and working for a nonprofit, and we're starting a new startup, which I believe is all based in social equity and alleviating some of the financial pressures on our community. However, I find that presenting the idea as altruistic and as good in my mind as it may be, because I'm presenting it from the point of a startup organization or a startup business, a for-profit startup business, I'm being met with a lot of resistance. Because people, especially in our Comox Valley, kind of feel that something of this social magnitude should be a nonprofit. And I don't feel that a nonprofit the constrictions on a nonprofit would work for what we're trying to do here. Basically, what we're trying to do is take bad debt between business owners and turn it into an opportunity for marketing between business owners. But I'm trying to do it from a nonprofit standpoint. I mean, I mean, from a personal profit standpoint, and people have been, so how are you going to make money off of this? It sounds like you're going to be screwing us part of my friend. <laughs> screwing us out of money so that you can make more. Where the opposite is true. Mm -hmm. The opposite is actually true. But I'm actually trying to take your money lost turn it into an opportunity for people to come and contribute back into the community. Mm -hmm. What would your advice be for a situation like that? Uh, consider a community contribution company. <laughs> so the community contribution company will give people the assurance that the articles of incorporation are in keeping with their values. So that's the beauty of that company, is that it allows a for-profit model, but gives social investors the opportunity to be assured that you're not going to, at, at the whim of the board, go off in a different direction, which you can in a traditional for-profit. The board has a vote and off you go in a different direction. So the community contribution company allows for social investment, allows um, shareholders to invest in social good. We haven't had a legal mechanism that has allowed that to happen before. and. Uh, to, to compare to a co-op as to when a co-op works and when it doesn't work. Um, if I am going to, I'm working on a project in Powell River right now and they're trying to come up with $4 million. If I'm putting $4 million in and you're putting $10 in, I don't want the same vote as him. <laughs> so if you have something that is truly like a farmer's market co-op where everybody can have an equal voice and it's really grassroots and everybody's okay with equal one member, one vote. The co-op model is a great model for community enterprise. However, if you're looking for investment and social capital and you're needing to generate investment, it is only reasonable that the person putting in the most money and taking the biggest risk also has more say. What the community contribution company allows you to do is define the parameters around which the whole business can work. It is set in perpetuity. And upon dissolution, let's say the community contribution company doesn't work and you've acquired $5 million worth of assets, 60% of the assets must return to the nonprofit sector. So 40, and there's limits on the amount of profit that can actually be shared with, with, um, with the private shareholders. There's a, a basically 40% of the profits, it's, uh, it's limited to 40% of the profits could be shared. The rest has to be reinvested continually in the, the business. So it kind of keeps a bit of a, a cap on runaway capitalism, which is the fear, mm -hmm. right? The fear is somebody is going to be making an awful lot of money and in actual fact, we want to keep this system contained. And that's what we really want in the Commonwealth Valley is we want to take all the dollars that are coming in here, we have a lot of public sector dollars coming into this community. We don't have a lot of private sector dollars. So let's take what we have and get, some more, get smarter at how we can recirculate those dollars around and around to fund our own social programs and very reluctantly let those dollars leak out the door at the end when they absolutely have to, but we should be working harder to keep them here as long as we can. You mentioned blondes earlier on. Uh, how, how, how I thought you said blondes, I was like, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs>
How, how does the bond work? concept work in your Okay, I'll try and give you a short answer. It's emerging. This whole sector is emerging. So nothing is cast in stone. In the UK, the first social impact bonds were used to address recidivism. So um, you can go online and look at a prison in Peterborough. And what it takes three partners to create a bond, a social impact bond. You need a non-profit with a proven program that works. You have to be able to demonstrate we have a program that if we scale this up, could have an incredible social impact on what we're doing. Number two, you need the government. And number three, you need a philanthropist or a wealthy investor. Or, or a number of them. Or a number of them, yeah. A source of capital. The umbrella thinking is if a social service agency or a non-profit is able to deliver a social benefit that relieves the public purse, saves the UK government money, the UK government will share those savings with the investor. So if, in, the, in the, the case that's going on right now in Peterborough, if the non-profit can reduce recidivism, so it'd be something that John Howard Society he might be interested in, if they can reduce recidivism by 7%, the government will pay the investors, I think it's a 9% return. If they can reduce it by 12%, they will get a 15% return. In the UK model, the investor's capital is 100% at risk. So they need to really believe in the non-profit. Sometimes it's a board member who's a, you know, is a wealthy um, individual who happens to be a non-profit board member who really believes in the program. In the, in the US, Goldman Sachs has created a US version of the social impact bond, again to address recidivism. But the US model, the capital's never at risk. You only risk whether or not you get a return on your investment. So it's happening in different ways, and it will happen, I believe, in British Columbia. I think the first social impact bonds that we're going to see will be to address uh, Aboriginal economic development. And I think we're getting quite close to actually having the first one. We were, we were hearing today about the cost of a homeless person versus uh, a, a housed, healthy. That, that same person. Yeah. So, so the margin there is significant. Absolutely. If you can demonstrate relieving pressure on the public purse, it's a very different way of thinking to the, the cap in hand, please can we have, right. right? So it's paying, I think what we're talking about here is social impact investing. I was talking, I chose to focus today on social impact purchasing, but now we've sort of moved into social impact investing. And what you're going to see is people are going to less and less just hand over donations and say, off you go. They're more and more likely to say, I want to achieve this social impact and I'm willing to pay this many dollars if you can achieve that. But it will be contingent on you achieving that. And I think that's, um, that those sort of performance metrics um, are lacking in, in an awful lot of our uh, non-profits right now and it's a way that we will evolve. I think it's, it's a place we have to go. The red ball that you see Silicon Laman holding there is from Right to Play which is a charity that the Olympians uh, support. When we were trying to come up with the whole concept behind Right to Play of the Red Bull, we said, what we want is, is we need to bring joy. This was an international development um, initiative, how you help children who are living in their entire childhood in refugee camps. We said, well, joy. What, can we, what brings joy? Play. It's the most natural thing in the world. So, okay, so you introduce a soccer ball and you have joy. From joy comes hope. And then from hope, anything's possible. I see that that's the same continuum that we're talking about for homelessness. You know, there needs to be some element of hope. And, and that can come from a job, it can come from somebody taking an interest, it can come from a, a roof over their head. But absolutely, somebody who has hope has a chance of moving on to the next stage of continuum and I think it's 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 not to be overlooked. The, the you know the soft people look at me as the marketer. But uh, often those are the words that you need.
to bring people into the room and to really start the conversations and to start even developing the questions that you want to ask. Okay. I just want to say, I've, it's, it's now five, <laughs> it's five to eight and we were supposed to be done for a little bit ago and uh, I want to thank Sandra very much. She, she said goodbye to her daughter yesterday and took the time to organize this presentation for us. So thank you very much, Sandra. Thank you. Perhaps if you want to ask her some questions after we uh, shut down, uh, that should be happy to have a conversation. Um, we've had a very full day, a very full day, uh, starting early this morning to set up. I want to thank the folks at the, 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 the Florence Philberg. They did a magnificent job of helping set up the, all of this furniture and keeping it moving and making it work for us. Uh, I want to thank the Housing Task Force who stepped up to the plate and did all of the little things that needed doing. I especially want to thank Monica Goodhart because she uh, really filled in a lot of the gaps where I was kind of feeling like, oh, I don't know if we can do this. And most of all, I want to thank our coordinator, Shannon Pickering. She has been the glue that's kept it all together. When I thought all the threads were gonna unravel, uh, she was there to make sure that they didn't. <laughs> and without her, we wouldn't have had today. And uh, our, our task force wouldn't have been able to continue on the way it has. So Shannon, I want to say thank you very much and uh, present you with some flowers. Please come over. Helping hands, helping hearts. Matt was here all day. Your mom was here most of the day. You had your nieces, and you know that's what that's what makes this successful. Um, just everybody really pitching in, and I just want to thank everybody who's come out, want to be a part of it, continue the conversation, and we will on go to cbhousing.ca. <laughs> See what happened today. We've got the, the events been filmed and there'll be a nice short video as well. And I hope you made connections. I hope you got new ideas. And thank you again for coming and see you next time.